this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this eighth episode of Lawyer On Air. I'm Catherine O'Connell. Today, I'm joined by Naomi Koshi, who is a partner at Miura and Partners in Tokyo. Naomi holds multiple degrees from Hokkaido University, an LLM from Harvard Law School, and she served as a visiting fellow to Columbia Business School. She is admitted to the Japan, New York, and California bars. What is really unique about Naomi is that in 2012, she was elected as the mayor of Otsu City. Otsu is the capital city of Shiga Prefecture, about 350 kilometers southwest of Tokyo. When you walk out of Otsu Station, you will see the shores of beautiful Lake Biwa, the largest lake in Japan. It's just 10 minutes from famous Kyoto, but Otsu has a completely different atmosphere than famous Kyoto. There are fewer tourists in Otsu and the city is calm and pleasant. It was in this off the beaten track town of Otsu with over 340,000 residents that Naomi served as mayor of the city until the start of 2020. Japan is a country where only 3% of the city's mayors are female. So she was in a niche league with just that fact. But not only that, she was the youngest female mayor ever elected in Japan at that time. And when she finished the role in January 2020, some eight years later, she still held the title for youngest female mayor elected. Since then, another young female has succeeded as being youngest female mayor elected in Japan. As mayor, Naomi walked her campaign talk and fought strongly to expand opportunities for Japanese women, especially through improving the childcare system. As part of this mayoral journey, Naomi was selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. She was named an OECD champion mayor for inclusive growth. How she got to be mayor is a story in itself, so do listen in. And I had the distinct pleasure of first hearing Naomi speak at an American Chamber in Japan Women in Business event at the end of last year. And then I invited her to speak on Girls Festival Day on March 3rd, 2021, to the members of Women in Law Japan. Her story is so intriguing. And like me, I am sure you'll be drawn in to how Naomi has used her lawyer DNA to strategically make a plan to become mayor and really make a change. She has shown me that we can all, as lawyers, strive to go bigger and bigger and impact other people's lives wider and deeper, beyond our usual realm of lawyering. Naomi is frank in expressing her ideas around the gender gap in Japan and imbalance of women on boards, so much so that while doing her day job as a partner in her law firm, she's recently launched a company that focuses on training women to be exceptional board members and helping companies think differently about diversity in the boardroom. And we'll hear about that exciting new chapter. Naomi also features on the front cover of June issue of bengoshi.com, a Japanese language print and online magazine catering to lawyers. It talks about her transition from lawyer to mayor to lawyer and probed her career decisions. I've made a point of talking about that today because I think it's fabulous that she is everywhere to be seen right now. So as you can tell, probably from this introduction, Naomi is a leading and incredible lawyer, and I'm super proud to have her as my guest today. Naomi, welcome to the show. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to have you. And today we're going to talk about a lot of topics, your study journey and career as a lawyer in Japan and America, and how you achieved becoming mayor of Otsu City, uh, your move to Miura and partners, and your exciting new venture focusing on women serving on boards. And I'd also love you to offer up some gems of advice for young lawyers on the importance of having a varied career 
um, and having chances to be catalysts for change. How does that sound? That sounds great. Okay, well, today we are talking online, uh, but if we were going to be meeting up in person, where would you and I be? Do you have a favorite wine bar or a restaurant that you love to go to? And what would be your choice of beverage off the menu? Oh, so now I'm in Otsu. Oh, wow. Yeah, and there are a lot of great cafes by Lake Biwa, the oh. biggest in Japan. So I want to go to cafe, that cafe with you. That's, yeah, would be great. That sounds fabulous. Is there one that looks out to the lake? Yes, yes. Oh, very, right. nice. very nice. And what would you choose? What would you be recommending? Is there a special Otsu kind of coffee or drink that we could try and have while we were there? Ah, yes. We have uh, sake. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we, the, actually, there are two sake breweries in Otsu. It's very good. Sounds fantastic. Maybe we could go to visit. Uh, the Otsu breweries for sake um, and also have some tastings there together. Yes, yes. Sounds so good. I can't wait to do that. I'm really glad to hear that you're an Otsu. It really makes lots of sense for us to be talking today that you are right there right now. So let's talk about your early days and uh, your substantial career path so far. So now you're back in Otsu right now, but tell me about growing up in Otsu and who was it? a big influence on you in those days? Yeah, I was raised in Otsu and I live with my parents, sister and my grandmother. And I think uh, my mother worked as a designer, but she quit her job after she had to take care of my grandmother. So I think at that time, I thought women have to quit job to take care of families. And it was sometimes hard. And I start thinking about maybe we should change this situation. Even I was a junior high school student. Right. So junior high school, what, what age were you then when you were thinking about this, trying to change things? Uh, it was 14 or 15. Right. So did, what did you want to be when you were a child was it around then that you thought about how can I make a change and what kind of job could I do to make a change uh, I don't have uh, any clear idea I wanted to involve maybe in local administration or to change our city at right. that time. But, but, but I didn't think about mayor no and what about the law then? When did you feel this calling to come to be in the law? Do you have lawyers in your family? No, I don't have it. Oh. But I uh, entered Hokkaido University, uh, law faculty. And, but I think many Japanese students choose law faculty. Why do they choose law? Because I've got friends as well who choose law, but they don't actually become lawyers. But That's right. Why do people choose law and why did you choose law? I think people think it's good. Very few people think about uh, being a lawyer. But if you go to good company, law faculty is good. Ah, I see. So it's a good reputation. And then you did your law study. And after that, did you join the big law firm Nishimura and Asahi? Was there a gap or did you join them pretty soon after? First, uh, when I was a student at Hokkaido University, I took bar exam. Yes. Uh, I failed three times. Oh, you what? You failed yeah, three I, times? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Oh. <laughs> because I think first I was, uh, I took bar exam when I was third grade, uh, but I didn't pass it. And I took three times. I failed and I was so depressed. And, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm smiling about this, Naomi, because I really love that you've told us this because it's it's showing some real trust and vulnerability to tell us this because it also makes a, a story for others to hear this, that you are doing what you are doing now, but at the time you didn't pass the exam, not once, not twice, but three times, yes. and you still kept going. 
So for me, you you explaining this story right now is absolutely amazing. And I thank you for saying it. How did you get the energy to do it three times and then finally get there? What happened to make you keep going? Actually, I didn't have choice. I mean, I at that time, around 2000, the economy was very bad. And especially for female students, we couldn't find company to hire us. So comparing women, a male student could find uh, companies, but we, we couldn't find it. So after I failed three times, I didn't have choice to go to uh, Japanese companies. So I just took bar exam. So does that mean you passed on the fourth time? Yes, that's right. Oh, what year was that? Uh, it was uh, 2000. Wow, I really am impressed. I've actually got some goose bumps, you know, like Torihada, because I haven't heard anyone be so frank as you to tell us that. And the fact that you did that and continued, perhaps there wasn't a choice, but it did actually drive you because there was no choice. So when you finished law school, did you join the law firm straight away or what happened after you finished your law school and got the bar? Uh, first, uh, uh, I graduated from a Hokkaido graduate school, at law school, and I entered into a Japanese training institute. All, all lawyers go, went there at that time. So I joined Nishimura and Asahi in 2002. 2002. So that, that lawyers institute, the training institute, was the previous way that lawyers became uh, lawyers by doing the training and now things have changed a little bit but did that course take around one to two years yes my time is one and a half years right I see and then Nishimura and Asahi are Japan's biggest law firm right yes now it's a biggest and you joined them by design did you was your goal to work for them or did you send your applications to various uh, law firms how did you get that job when I was a Hokkaido University student, I had a chance to do internship at Nishimura Asahi. It was ah. 1999. Yes. It was amazing. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, because before that, I didn't know what lawyers do, especially I didn't know about M and A. Right. So when I worked at Nishimura Asahi, I really wanted to join that firm. So I wrote them letter, but also I know lawyers at Nishimura Asahi. Right. So I applied other firms, but I wanted to join Nishimura Asahi. So you really wanted to join them? Yes. And it sounds like it wasn't very important for them that you had not passed the bar exam several times. That didn't matter. What mattered was that you did pass and wanted to be a lawyer. Is that right? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, this is another story, Naomi, that a lot of people who are listening, and in fact me, might think that in order to join Nishimura and Asahi, you have to pass the bar the first time, you have to be a certain kind of person. But I really like the fact that Nishimura and Asahi and perhaps other big law firms are more broadly thinking than what we think ourselves and they they took you on and I think that's a fantastic story I really do mm -hmm. yes <laughs> <laughs> I hope so yeah oh, I think it's a great inspiration for people who are going to listen and during your time at Nishimura and Asahi is that when you were able to go to the U.S. and start studying there as well first I worked at Nishimura Asahi from 2002 to 2008 and usually uh you work there for five years, you can go to the U.S. They are uh, sponsors, they pay tuition. So they, I went to the Harvard Law School wow. in 2008. Yeah. How do you get chosen to go to Harvard Law School? Because that's the top law school, right? Well, I hope there are people who have gone to Yale or others will be listening and maybe saying, no, Yale is the top. But it is, of course, well-renowned. How did you get to land at Harvard? I applied maybe 10 law schools. Oh. But when I 
you know, uh, we have to write personal statement. So I was writing personal statement and my boss, uh, a partner, told me, uh, first I was uh, writing about my job, uh, M&A, and I want to study corporate law at Harvard Law School, and I coming back to Japan to continue to practice law, that kind of thing I first wrote. Right. My partner told me, this is the same, all uh, Africans mm. uh, write the same thing. So you should write something different from others. So I was thinking, oh, when I was a junior high school student, I was thinking about women's situation, my mom, and I was thinking about uh, involving uh, local administration cities and maybe politicians. So I changed my personal statement and I wrote, I do like to work uh, for women, that kind of thing. I rewrote my personal statement. I think maybe that was good. I definitely think it was good. How <laughs> incredible. And the partner. Are you still in touch with him? Yes. Yes, he he was managing partner at Nishimura Asahi, but he stepped, uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, bengoshi.com. Yes, I did. Magazine, and I referred his name in the interview. So I emailed him, and is this okay? And he said, okay. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I got- fantastic. That is really <laughs> great. And how thoughtful of him to have thought about you and to think that the personal statement needed to be different and stand out. And, oh, my goodness, it sure did, obviously. And so you were in the U.S. around the time that Barack Obama became president for his first term. So what was that like for you being there at that time? And how did that inspire you seeing Obama become president or other things that were happening at that time? That experience changed my life because... uh... At that time, in 2008, young students uh, at Harvard Law School, they are very uh, active. They made phone calls. They have meetings uh, for Obama. Mm. I was so surprised because in Japan, young people are not interested in politics. So at Harvard Law School, they are so active and they said, uh, we should change the world. And then... I thought, oh, I should do something to change the world. Right. So you already thought that at 2000, well, was it uh, 2000 when you were um, a student, right? You When you were a junior high school student, when you were 14, you thought yeah. about that when you were 14. And here you are again, seeing this inspiration from the students who were very active in politics and thought you've got to change the world again. So you're getting the same feeling and thinking um, coming through your life. And then after that study at Harvard, you didn't come right back to Japan. Did you stay in the U.S. for a while? Yes. I was seconded to uh, Debe Voice Primpton in New York City. Right. So, yeah, Nishimura sent me uh, Debe Voice Primpton. That was a great experience. And what did you do there? What kind of law were you start doing? And expert, you know, your expertise was in what kind of area? Was it the M and A area or somewhere else? Yes, M and A. And I worked with a Japanese client. Right, Japanese clients who were in the US or had business with um, back in Japan. Yeah, Japanese client in Japan. And that time at the firm was quite significant, I believe, for you to start your path to run for mayor when you came back to Japan, because you had some experience of one of your US male colleagues, what some people these days call a mic drop moment, right? One of your US colleagues did something that, again, inspired you to think about going for mayor. At David Voice, one day, my uh, co-worker, a male American lawyer, told me he was going to take paternity leave for a year. At that time, I was so surprised because uh, <laughs> in Japan, I had not heard of any male lawyers or employees around me about taking paternity leave. So I first realized uh, Japanese women's situation. Then I did some research and I found out almost 60% of women quit their job after 
having children because they could not find a nursery to take care of them. So I thought in Japan, mothers would quit job, not fathers. Right. Uh, yeah. So Japanese women had to make choice, job or children. So I, yeah, I first realized that issue. Right. So you had the surprise that a male colleague in the States was taking paternity leave and made you think about Japan and its situation. So that started you then, did it start you to think about how you could do more change actively? And what sort of action did you take then? Yes. So I want to change that situation, but I was thinking what I should do. Right. And maybe I, the mayor, each mayor have power to, to build nursery. Uh, mayor can decide how many nursery you have in your city. So I think uh, I, I thought I maybe run for mayor. <laughs> and I wrote letters to some politicians. There you go. You're writing more letters. Like you wrote letters to the law schools, now you're writing letters again. Let, never undermine <laughs> or underestimate the power of writing a letter. So even if your colleague, though, took paternity leave, right, and it's one thing to notice that, but it's really so much more, doing so much more to write letters. What made you think, I'm going to write letters? How did you know who to write to? How did you find out how to write to those people from the U.S., right? Yeah, so I wrote letters to some politicians and I do, I did research and I, I actually didn't know any politicians, but some politicians are from my city and from my prefecture, Shiga prefecture. So I wrote letter to, to you know, oh. representative senators from Shiga prefecture. I see. So you were writing your letters, but you had to come back to Japan did you come back to the firm first before doing anything else? Did you have to negotiate leaving the firm to go and run for mayor? Tell us about that part of your story. Yes, so I was seconded uh, to Deve Voice from 2009 to 2010, and I was thinking about running for mayor, but I couldn't decide it. I, I'm always thinking, but I couldn't decide it. So I need more time. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I, wanna, I wanted to stay in New York. And so I went to Columbia University. It's a, not a MBA. It's a visiting scholar at uh, Columbia Business School. So I went there for one year from 2010 to 2011. And I went back to Japan like for a week or two weeks and I met politicians whom I wrote later. And also some of them, uh, one of them told me, you don't know about campaign, so you should do volunteer. You know, in Japan, some every four years we have a local election. Yes. That election was uh, 2011. Yes. It, it was April and May. So I came back to Japan March 2011 after earthquake. I helped was doing volunteer for some local politicians. I see. So you volunteer and help support those politicians and then people get used to you and you also get to see some of the behind the scenes system. Yes, yeah, that's right. And he was disappointed. Disappointing. Mm. Why was that? Yeah, because uh, in the U.S., even young people are very active and they are very motivated. But in Japan, even if, you know, a candidate uh, made a speech, people are not interested. They made a speech at a station, but no one stopped by. No, they just passed by. They didn't listen to what they speak. I was disappointed. I found out people are not interested in politics. So mm. I didn't know what I should do because uh, people are not interested in politics, especially young people are not interested in politics. So if I run for mayor, if I lose, what I should do? It's interesting you say that. I often see people doing the campaigning at 
outside the station. And it's really almost the worst place because people are trying to get to work or somewhere else very quickly. So they have no time to stop and listen. So, you know, I think of in New Zealand, when the politicians are there, they are in the neighborhood or they are in locations where people are relaxing and have time to stop. So it might be a, a, a thing that needs to change in Japan on that on that scale. But so you're going from this feeling frustrated and still want to become a mayor. And so what changes for you? So I sometimes, uh, oh, I shouldn't do this because, because I can't win because young people are not interested. And I was thinking for, you know, one year. But one day, uh, my friend told me uh, two things. First, uh, he said, uh, I was thinking, I was uh, so tired of thinking because I was thinking for one year. And he mm. said, he told me, uh, you are lucky because you have choices all over the world. In the world, few people have choice. Many people can choose uh, where to live, what kind of job you have. They can't choose that. So you have choices, you are lucky. So you should think about it. So I was relieved because I was tired of thinking. And also another friend told me, uh, you should do what only you can do. He was also a corporate lawyer. And he said, uh, you know, do diligence, other kind of job. And at a big law firm, you are one of them. You can, of course, work, but other people can take over your job when you leave. As a mayor, mayor is only one. So you should do what only you can do. Also, mm. some people told uh, Japanese, I wrote later some Japanese politicians, and some of them said, you are too young. You have no experience. But my friend told me, because you are young and because you are women, you can make difference. So that word made me decide to run for mayor. That's amazing. You had people who were maybe they were mentors or not really mentors but people who could see the the possibility of you becoming mayor and how you could change things and they helped you with these amazing inspirational words like you are lucky and that you know do what you only can do and i think that is incredible did that change you then after maybe a little bit more thinking you then decided to act and run for mayor yes so i went back to Japan in July 2011. First, I went back to Nishimura Asahi. I worked there, but I was thinking, still thinking about running for mayor. And I quit Nishimura Asahi in November and I ran for mayor. And I did my campaign for three months. I think it's quite short. And I was elected in January 2012. Yay, that's amazing. Um, so incredible. I wish I'd known you around that time to see your what was happening. But when you were campaigning, it wasn't always smooth. There were some people who I heard from you physically and even verbally, um, or I should say verbally and even physically, abused you and gave you such uh, a backlash, but you kept going. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, so I ran for mayor in 2011. Also, my mayor's term is four years, so I ran again. So both time, one thing is one man kicked me when I was uh, at the station. Yeah. So yeah, Incredible. I was handing over the, my flyers, and he said he complained about my high school. I don't know why it's a problem, but he uh, complained about high school. That make no sense, and he kicked me. Unbelievable. Also, another day, uh, one man came to me, and he said, you are bad, you don't listen to others. It was my second term, so he knew me, and he criticized me because uh, I think he expects women to follow men that kind of thing. So he said, uh, you are very bad and you should listen to old men, that kind of thing. And he was shouting and 
Yeah, sometimes it happens. Right. Um, yes, some people do react negatively in some way or they have something else going on in their lives as well. But when you joined, you became right the mayor, you joined the Otsu city um, as the mayor of their city, you did two terms. But during those terms, how was it inside the organization? Because I believe the mayors before you were, you know, 70, 80 year old men. So you were quite different coming in. Can you tell us any stories that happened during that time, your eight years there? Anything that stands out for you? So first, we had a lot of argument. For example, one day I, uh, I had a meeting with my subordinate. But they are, you know, all of them are older than me, and most of them are men, and they were 55 or 59 years old, because a uh, city hall employee is the same as J- traditional Japanese company employees have the lifetime employment system. One day I had a meeting with the employees, and I was trying to convince them to adopt one of my policy, and one of the manager got so mad and he shouted, punched the desk and left slamming the door loudly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was so surprised. Yes, yes. If you did that in corporate Japan, you'd probably be maybe not dismissed, but something would happen if, you know, you, if that happened was inside a corporate organization. They wouldn't stand for that kind of behavior. So he slammed the desk and, or punched the desk and slammed the door, leaving uh, the room. Did he change after that or people like him? Did they become to accept you and you could still have your heated discussions, but they were very good discussions. They became more healthy. How did it go after that? I think it's changed. Not everyone, but uh, I had more meeting with employees and uh, some of them yeah, understood me. And also I understood what they think. So in my second term, it got much better. Right. And how did you use your lawyer skills to execute your role as a mayor? Is there something you learned or some strength or skill as a lawyer that helped you to be a, a really good mayor? Yeah. Uh, lawyer skills helped me a lot because uh, I'm not specialist about uh, administrative law, but I think uh, city hall is like company. So we have to serve to citizens as corporation have to serve for shareholders. Yes. So I, I always think about uh, we have to responsibility to our citizens and uh, in my city, we have bully case. A junior high school student committed suicide mm. after bully. Right. So it, it was it happened before I was elected, but after I was elected, I start uh, some some investigation about the bully. Mm. So I uh, set up uh, some investigating committee. Uh, I think I could do that because I was a lawyer. I know how how to, because that independent committee was needed. Yes, and also that feeling of justice. Yes, that's Needing right. to have justice for the family and the victim. That's um, right. And, and try and resolve things. And you also use that lawyer skill, I think, to make those changes that you talked about, that you that came to your mind way back when you were 14 and in your family where your mum had to give up her role to, to look after you children and also that incident in the Americas where you were also inspired uh, by the man who took paternity leave. So you, you changed things in Otsu, didn't you? You changed things with the childcare facilities. Tell us about that story. It's an amazing story. Oh, thank you. So that was my motivation and that was my motivation to run for mayor so I want to change the situation of Japanese women so I for eight years I built 54 nurseries for 3,000 children 54 54 nurseries for 3,000 children yes for eight years wow 
because before in Japan, you know, we call waiting child. Waiting child means they have to wait to enter into nursery. So mm -hmm. if you don't, you can't find nursery, mothers have to quit job. Right, it's a big so, problem. Yeah, you, it was big problem. So in my city, there were waiting child. So I built 54 nursery and there were no more waiting child. So they don't have to wait to put their children in nursery. As a result, the number of working mothers with children under five years old has increased by 70%. 70, seven zero. Yeah, seven zero. Wow. Incredible. That was what I want to do. And also the population of old city has increased because young couples with children move to Otsu because they can find nurseries. Yes, it's an attractive place for people to go to because of what you had achieved and created for them. So it's let's go and live in Otsu. Whereas many may not have thought about that before, you created a reason for them to move to the town. Yeah, that's right. So so for eight years, I did that and it was my goal. So I felt I achieved my goal. So I didn't run for mayor again. Right. During that time with the other case you mentioned, did the investigation change things as well that you had, that investigation that you did? I did investigation for the junior high school student. And before that, all over Japan, we, we have education board. So education board didn't investigate the suicide cases. But uh, after that, we have independent investigation committee to investigate bully cases. So I think it was a big change. Yeah, if you were to repeat that eight years again, is there something you would do differently or would you do exactly what you did when you were there? Ah, yes, exactly what I did. Right, yeah. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because uh, I think citizens, not me, citizens decide if I was good or not. But myself, I did my best. Yes, yes. Would you ever consider running and for another public service role like central government? Or are you more attracted to bottom-up change in Japan? And we're going to talk about your adventure in your new entrepreneurial business. But I wondered as I was preparing for this, if you had thought about running for a central government role. No, I will mm. not run for <laughs> any position. Right. That I wanted to be a mayor. Yes. To improve women's situation. Yes. So I think I did that. Good. So my goal was not being mayor. My goal was change women's situation. So I think improving child care system is just start. So I will keep doing working for women, but not as a politician. <laughs> right. So that's it, right? That you wanted to change things. That was your goal. It wasn't to become a mayor. But the mayor was the vehicle, the way in which you could make that change. That's an incredible point to make. And is there a female mayor's club or alumni that you belong to? Or how are you supporting other women rise to that mayoral role? You mentioned the new person who is now the youngest. Did you provide any help in that person's success? Yeah, there is a female mayor's association but uh, there are very few female mayors. And after I stepped down, young uh, female politician who is a city council, not all the other city, uh, asked me to make a lecture for them. So I, I'm going to do some lecture for young, ma young female city council. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And you can inspire them. Maybe one or two will decide to do something as well, make a change um, and become a mayor in order to do the change. So that's that's great to hear. I want to now move on from your where you were as mayor, and I wanted to spend time on that story because it really is inspirational and really amazing what you've told us. Um, but now you are working back as a lawyer in a firm, and your 
thinking about entrepreneurship. So how has that, that transition been back from being a mayor into the law firm as a partner? And you're at Miura and Partners. How has that change been? And how have your clients reacted to you as a former mayor of a city? Uh, I stepped down in January 2002, uh, January 2020, and I plan to travel all over the world, but I couldn't uh, due to COVID-19. Yes. And I was thinking at home. First, uh, I took California bar exam. Oh, you took the California bar last year. Last year, because... Uh, I had to stay home. I couldn't go anywhere. One reason is uh, as a mayor, I introduced some uh, new technologies like uh, self-driving bars and drones and AIs. So I uh, promoted smart city project. I'm very interested in uh, changing citizens' life by using new technology. Oh, that's great. So I was very interested in new technologies and uh, startups. So I studied California Bar because I, I'm very interested in Silicon Valley. So I, after I took Bar exam, I joined Miura and Partners. And now I'm doing, I focus on smart city project and also a public-private partnership. Because I, as a mayor, I did some public-private partnership. Also, I are supporting startups. Yeah, so one of my questions was, what was your expertise and what are you um, focusing on? So you've just told me, smart city projects. I know of one other lawyer in Japan who's doing similar, but it's really a niche area. As so, as, so is the public-private partnership. I think that's rather niche area as well for you to focus in yeah what do you love most about your job then yeah I love uh, both I love a smart city and public private partnership because I have experience as a mayor not only uh, about law I based on my experience I can give advice to client so I'm very interested and excited Yes, and I'm going to talk about your new company in a moment, but I also know that you have an outside board role as well as being a partner in a firm. Tell us about that role. I, I don't know much about it, so I'd love to know how you got that role and what it is that lawyers do to bring their skills to the boardroom table. Yes, so now I serve as an outside director at both VCube and SoftBank. Uh, Vcube is a webinar company. A webinar company. Yeah. Ooh. And SoftBank is a, you know, a cell phone and other IT company. Yes. And so I started Vcube uh, last year and I have just started SoftBank. This Congratulations. <laughs> well, you just voted in in the last shareholders meeting. Yes, shareholders meeting in June. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. So I think both are very important job. So in Japan, this is my new uh, company, but uh, in Japan, we need more female directors. And sorry, 35% female directors are actually lawyers in Japan. Really? 35% yes. of female directors in Japan are lawyers? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, lawyers uh, has uh, expertise expertise in governance, but also the other reason is the company Japanese company have to find female directors, but they can't find female director candidate in their company because there are very few female managers, so they uh, choose lawyers. So I served as uh, outside directors, and I like uh, technology and innovation. So I, I'm not a trained engineer, but I'd like to be part of movement to use technology to change the world 
And also, I do like to empower female employees at the company. For example, I had lectures, meetings with female employees. So that's what I can do. Are you having the lectures at VCube and SoftBank? Or are you doing that in various companies? People are asking you to come and do the lecture. Actually, I did as a lawyer. Also, I did at VCube. But uh, Japanese companies, have you, you have some uh, training for female employees. So sometimes I did lecture for female employees. Oh, that's great. That is really great. And I... I'm interested because we're going to talk shortly about this more, but this excuse in a way that there's not enough candidates in the company to become directors because there are no managers who are women. And so it really starts further back in the process by having more women. And so let's go there. Let's go to this exciting new project of yours, which is on board a company that you set up. Tell me about this project and congratulations. I know your goal is to promote women on boards and into managerial positions. And I really think this is a magnificent goal because in previous times when I've listened to you, you've told me about the World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report. Around 5% of board members in Japan are women in 2020 and only you know, that's only 5%. And then I think that managers and companies who were women, your percentage that you said previously was 12%, just 12%. And then I also heard you mention that in 2016, that figure of board members who were women was 3%. So it has doubled in four years, but Japan's score of female board members compared to other countries is still very low. And I'm going to cite you again, your figures that you told us last time when I listened to you, France had 42%, Australia, I picked out uh, 33%. You talked about Germany and Germany and New Zealand are exactly the same, around 30%, UK 24 and the US 60%. Tell us more about this program and gosh, how many people are doing it and how many lawyers and what's the goals? Tell us a lot about this project. I really want our listeners to hear. Thank you. So besides uh, practicing law, I was thinking uh, as a mayor, I improved child care system, but it's just start. So now I was questioning, are women in the same position as a man in a company? Do women get the same salary as a man? The answer, of course, is no. Mm. So my next goal as an entrepreneur is to promote more women being on board. And so I started my own company called On Board with my partner, Kaoru Matsuzawa, who is also partner at Miura and Partners. So uh, as you mentioned, Japan is very behind. In July last year, there were only 6% of female board members in Japan. Yes. So behind. and uh, But now we have movement. Tokyo Stock Exchange has amended the corporate governance court, which now requires a diversified board, including women and foreigners. Also, uh, Japanese government, uh, they have planned uh, the Japanese government fifth gender equality basic plan called for directors and statutory auditors at the first rate Tokyo Stock Exchange listed companies to be at least 12% female by 2022. And also Keidanren, the Japanese, Japan's primary business federation, has called for 30% female representation among board members by 2030. So now we have movement and Japanese company has pressure from their investors and they have they think they have to increase the number of female directors. So what we do is first we train candidate and now we, we have started our seminar in May. And now 
60 people, 60 people joined our seminar, and half is a lawyer and half is a corporate executive. We had lecture about uh, legal aspect, accounting, also female directors talks about her experience. Uh, fem- uh, one is a female director talks about her experience. Also other directors, including male, talks about what outside director should do. Also, we introduce female candidate to Japanese companies. So we have just started, but uh, many people, more people than we expected are interested in our work. That's amazing. And so you said 60 people are in this first program. How many programs will you have each year? Do you hope to hold more than one this year or will the second one be in 2022? Uh, this year is we have uh, now we have seminar and we plan to have another seminar this year. Maybe next year we have more. So if someone is just hearing about this program now, Naomi, can they join partway through or should they wait and do another round? What's your advice for that? You can join now. Uh, we have recording so you can watch uh, our recording. But also you can start maybe in fall, but I think it's a little bit different from this uh, basic uh, seminars. But yeah, you can contact to on board. Sure, sounds good. Mm-hmm. And so you mentioned you were also doing introductions. Is that the matching service I heard you talk about in another session? Is that matching candidates to companies? How does that work? Some, some companies already uh, ask us to find a candidate. And we more focus on startups because uh, there are some uh, search firms uh, which already, you know, recruiting job. But uh, for startups, they always are looking for candidate. And for candidate, for example, lawyers, some very famous uh, lawyers have already three or four positions as outside directors. So we focus on younger generation, like our generation, uh, 40s, uh, maybe 30s. We try to match younger lawyer, one young female lawyer to start up. Mm, okay, that's really nice because I think it's not that the old the startups don't want older lawyers, but you're also bringing up another generation of young lawyers who can contribute to young startups as well. So that seems like a nice match to have. Is it working well? Yes. So now is some startups ask us to find a candidate, especially we have a lot of lawyers candidate. So yeah, we work very hard. I'm excited to hear that. What would you like to accomplish in the next 12 months for this program? We will do more seminars. People enjoy this seminar. So some people couldn't join. So we have second seminar, third seminar, maybe fourth seminar. And also we are trying to match more candidate to company. And usually in Japan, um, many company have annual shareholders meeting in June. So by next June, we will do more matching. Wonderful. And how about... The next five years, have you seen a vision for you taking this program beyond now and thinking about five years? Or do you want to take your time and see how it it develops? Not in five years, but in 10 years. 10 years, okay. Yeah, but in 10 years, I mean, now there uh, are only 6% female directors. Yes. Kedan then said they're going to have 30% 30% in 2030. So we need 10,000 female directors in 10 years. So if every year, that means every year, 1,000. Oh. So in five years, we need uh, 5,000 uh, female candidates. So I have to work very hard. Oh, that's a massive, massive uh, assignment for you and I hope we can all help you there but 10,000 female directors by 2030 to reach the Kedan Ren's target incredible 
I think we can do it. We have to put our mind to it, but it sounds big right now. Um, if it was 30%, that would take Japan up to the levels of Germany and New Zealand where they are now. So that's interesting to think about, isn't it? That it would still take 10 years to get to the percentage where two other countries are already at. What can we learn from the other countries? And perhaps you could bring in people from other countries, female directors, to give seminars and lectures as well. How to change from the influence from outside of Japan. Yes, that's very important. And you should teach us. (laughs) I can yeah. teach anything as, if you'd yeah. like that, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. because uh, outside Japan, it's very different. They are very advanced. And for some companies, for example, France, they have law. Also, you know, now is a uh, California state have law. They have to have uh, minority directors. And also NASDAQ have some rules. So, but now is that we have uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange has a corporate governance code and Japan and Japanese company has changed because of foreign investors. We should learn from foreign countries, their system. Also, we need uh, more foreign directors. Corporate governance code uh, said your board should be diverse, including women, foreigners, young people. So I think we need more foreigners too. Exactly. So if I concentrate on women lawyers becoming board members, what can women lawyers contribute to boards? One is a legal skill, for example, uh, compliance and uh, m and So some company expect legal skill. I think the board members in total, they have now we have a skill matrix. This director has this skill, legal accounting, this director has this skill. So not only for female directors, but for lawyers, companies expect a legal skill, but it's very important. And also, I think uh, some people have different opinion, but female directors have sometimes different opinion from men. For example, for me, I try to ask uh, the number of uh, female managers because uh, I think each company have more female managers. So I try to focusing on empowering women. I think uh, female lawyers can do that kind of thing. Mm, okay, yes, a different kind of approach to maybe other directors who may not ask, ask those questions. And of course, bringing those legal skills, that's something that we have that really is becomes part of us. So we don't always see that it's special, but it, it really is special and useful for a board uh, to have those skills from an outside or internal director. That's really amazing. And I would so love to keep talking, Naomi, but we have covered a lot of the topic. And I know that people who want to hear more will find ways of following you and connecting with you. But let's change gears a little bit. And I just love to hear about your routine. Um, Usually I love my guests to tell us about what guiding routines they have at the end of the day and the beginning of the day. How do you start and finish your day, Naomi? I'm not good at getting out of bed. <laughs> I'm not morning person, so okay. I'm always not good in the morning. At night, I work and I, yeah, at night, I'm, yeah, I'm better. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any kind of routine that starts you off? You, I mean, you're an otsu now, so is there probably more family time and... Yes taking your dog for a walk and things like that, that you, you fit in during your day? Yeah, before I walked with my dog at uh, in the evening, but he's now very old. He's now eight, almost 18. Ooh. So it's too hot to walk outside yes. in the evening. I, I enjoy my time with Ron. That's his name. Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Ron, how did you come up with the name Ron? We didn't name him uh, after I was elected as mayor. Yes. I 
adopted him. Oh, I see. He was, he was in a uh, city owned shelter, dog shelter, oh. and we adopted him. Lovely. I love yeah. that story. Oh, that's so wonderful. Do you have a word of the year or a theme that guides you? Yes. Uh, as I told you, my friend Ward, uh, you should do what only you can do. You should do what only you can do. That is amazing. So that's been the what guides you each all the time now. Yes. So still mm. I'm thinking about it. For example, my company on board, that what only I can do because I I'm a lawyer, I was mayor, so I have been empowering women. So I think that's my work. Wonderful. And if you could swap jobs with somebody for a day or a week, is there anyone you would want to change jobs with? Oh, maybe I would be a singer. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> really? Because, because I'm very bad at singing. Even <laughs> if I go to karaoke, right. I, I never sing. Right. So... <laughs> a singer. So mm. it would be great if I can sing. Wonderful. And something maybe have you ever have you received a compliment recently from someone that you smile about in private? So it's something someone said to you that was nice that you maybe don't talk about out loud, but when you're back in your room and you think about it, is there something like that that someone said to you that makes you smile? Oh, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> well, hopefully from what I've told you today with some of the praise I've given you that you will later on reflect and smile about that. Yeah. I think it's um, you're, you're an amazing person. So how about advice that you've received? The best advice sounds like it would be perhaps what you've already told us from some of your people that are around you. Is that the best advice that you've received? And maybe you've got the worst piece of advice that you received that you could tell us. Yes, so the best advice uh yeah, also I said already, but yes, yeah, when I was thinking about uh, my choices, my friend told me, you are lucky. I was tired of thinking, but I'm lucky I have a choice. Yes. So still I'm thinking, sometimes I feel like lost. I don't know what I should do. But at that time, I remind that word. I'm lucky I have choices. I have freedom. So that makes me weep. Mm, it's very deep. And even you with a goal that you've got and the other goals, you can often feel still lost and not sure what to do. And I think in your case, it seems like to me that you already want to know what your next goal is. What else can you achieve? Rather than not knowing what you want to do, it's what can Naomi Koshi do next? Have you got some advice for young lawyers and students who are coming up the ranks, how they can think about their careers and their life? Yes, so I think uh, each lawyer have, should have speciality and each lawyer should do what they really want to do. So I think uh, make difference is very important for lawyers because now is that there are more the number of lawyers increasing in Japan. So, for example, you have uh, some specialty in law or you are, so, so you need some specialty. And if you like it, you can continue to do that. So I think specialty is very important. It's interesting because some people think they should just do what others are doing. So how do you find a speciality and how do you make a difference? Maybe that's what the, the the lawyers listening who are young would think. So how do you encourage them to think of their speciality and how would you encourage them to think about how to make a difference? For me, uh, as a mayor, I like uh, new technology, introducing new technology because I saw uh, that changed people's life. Uh, for example, there is no bus uh, to go to some uh, mountain. But if you have self-driving car, uh, that changed people's life. So for me, I liked it. Yes. So I still uh, 
keep doing that, not as a mayor, but as a lawyer. Mm. So I have, uh, yeah, so I have very strong motivation. So I, and also law, mayor's experience make a difference. So mm. for young lawyers, I think uh, they should find what they like, what they are interested in and focus on that thing. Perfect. Naomi, is there anything we haven't covered today that you'd like to mention or anything you've said that you would like to emphasize again? Yes, that, that's perfect. Yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So let's finish up with the final, what I call super six, which is the quick fire round of six questions that I ask every guest as we wind up the interview. So the first is, of course, considering it's compliant, and I could give you a million yen in cash in Japan, where would you spend it? Your favorite store or a destination or both of that, those things? So I want to invest in my company on board. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's a good answer. How about <laughs> uh, a book that you've read recently or you are reading or maybe a podcast you've listened to uh, that you recommend? I don't uh, read book recently, but I like Haruki Murakami, so I like his novel. He did New Norwegian Wood and many yes. other uh, publications, didn't he? Yes. yes. Ah, okay. And what about if you were stuck on a desert island and you had to take one person, one item, and one food? What would they be? Who are they? My dog. Yay. Ron. <laughs> Ron, of course. Yes, but he, I'm not sure he can go there because he's now too old. But this is a system that works with no matter what, there's magic. So you, <laughs> you're just there. What would you take with you and what food? Yes, I want vegetable, but mm. maybe there are vegetable. I don't know. <laughs> vegetable. I like vegetable. Keeping healthy. Okay, yeah. good. Is there someone famous that you've... Uh, met before or would love to meet a celebrity? She's not famous, but uh, I want to meet my grandmother again. No. She's, yeah, but uh, I want to meet her. Yeah. How old was she when she passed away? Uh, it was 2001 and mm -hmm. she was 97. 97. Yes, I bet you want to meet her again. I'm sure. And what then do you have on your bedside cabinet? Do you have a photo of your grandmother? No, I haven't. I actually I don't have <laughs> anything. But we have uh, my grandmother's pictures yes. uh, in my house. Exactly. And tell me something then about you that nobody else knows. Now I'm very nervous. Because I speak English, when I make a speech in Japanese, I'm confident. I'm not nervous. Mm. But I, when I have to speak English, I'm always nervous. You do not sound nervous, and I'm sure everyone's going. She doesn't sound nervous. You you don't. Maybe you feel it, but you don't sound it, Naomi. So take <laughs> take, yeah, take notice of that because you certainly don't sound it. Well, thank you, Naomi, for sharing so much of your story and telling us about your entrepreneurial lawyering venture, sharing your tips with the young lawyers. And it really has been great to connect with you in this way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So how can people connect with you? Could we do that through your website or what would be a good place to connect with you? Yes, the website is good. Uh, Miura and the partners have website. Also, Onboard KK has a website. Great. Well, we will put that in the show notes. So anyone who is interested in connecting and learning more from you can find out how to get in touch with you. Is that okay if they reach out to you through your websites? Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, I'd like to finish up there today. And we've had this fantastic conversation about your fascinating journey uh, where you're really modeling for lawyers at all stages of their career that there's not just one way to lead a lawyer life, but many ways. And you've given us the evidence that it's possible for each and every one of us to do many things in our studies and our career and our life, and to really make a change if we decide to do that. You've shown 
several times through our conversation that you had a goal and you succeeded in it. And now you're moving to your next goal. And I really believe you're a female leader who is showing us that if we each and every one of us set our mind to it, we can achieve our aspirations. I'm so grateful for you coming on and being my eighth guest in this first season of Lawyer on Air um, out of a total of 10. So two more to go. And I really thank you for sharing your journey. And for my listeners, please do like this episode, subscribe to Lawyer on Air and drop us a short review because that really does help us get out on the airwaves. You can also actually lodge a voicemail on my webpage right now. I love hearing actual voices from guests. So please go ahead, share this episode with someone you think will enjoy listening to it and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer lady life. That's all for now. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Kasari. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer on Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, so please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.